OK, so let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Zainab Hakim. Uh, hopefully, you guys had a good lunch. It's kind of a hard slot to get everyone to focus after lunch, so I'll try my best. Um, I've been uh, a program manager in Microsoft on the Windows team. I work on the application experiences team. And for Windows 8, I worked on uh, aspects of the app model related to uh, packaging and deployment for the new app model uh, for the Windows Store apps. And prior to that, I was working on uh, installation technologies for desktop apps. Uh, but today, uh, I'm going to talk about the work we've done on Windows 8.1, and that is to really make it easy for your apps to integrate with people and events. And uh, there's my team back in Redmond uh, who's worked super hard to enable these scenarios. So I'd like to give a shout out to them as well. So um, today what we're going to talk about is um, how you can connect your apps to people so your users can quickly look up information about their contacts and also interact with them using their preferred communication mechanism, whether it's emailing, messaging, uh, posting on their wall, whatever that form may be. We'll also see how you can get events quickly into, your, into the user's calendar so that a user can um, have an aggregated view of everything that's going on in their calendar by being able to quickly add those events um, to their calendar. And we'll see a lot of exciting demos uh, to really show you how these experiences light up in your apps. And then there will be uh, some code demos and Renarty APIs uh, that make it possible for you to do this in your apps. Um, if you have questions, um, I'd prefer if you could hold them towards the uh, end of the session. Uh, we'll probably have time. And then I'm also going to be available at the uh, expo hall and the apps and presentation area uh, if you want to come talk and have more questions um, then. So application contracts, um, this is, uh, before we get started on that, I just wanted to get a feel from the room. Uh, how many people in here have written a Windows Store app or have apps in the store? Wow. OK, quite a few of you. Um, so if you write these Windows Store apps, you quickly come across this concept of uh, application contracts. And what contracts are is um, they're the glue that kind of uh, tells Windows about how your, how your apps interact with other apps on the system, and also uh, with the system itself. So this is best explained um, with an example on Windows 8. So what I have here is the Maps app. And one of the things you do with the, map app, with the Maps app is you want to look up directions. And so when I do that, I can either go in and type the address of the person whose, direct, whose location I'm trying to look up, uh, look up, or I can choose that address from another app. So the way I do this uh, in the Maps app is by something called the People Picker contract, which was introduced in Windows 8. And what that does is that it launches the People app uh, right in, the, in, in, in a particular place in the app's UI that enables you to just go and pick the person whose address you want to map. So let's say we're picking Wendy. And then I get Wendy's address right back into the Maps app. So the communication here happened between two apps. Right? There's the Source app, which is the Bing Maps app that activates or initiates an action, which in this case is like, I want to map an address. Uh, go get me the address from this other app. And that target side of the contract was fulfilled by the People app, which has information about contacts and their addresses. And so People app was able uh, to launch to a specific place in, in its app UI, uh, which allowed me to quickly pick an address. And um, now I can go ahead and map that. So that's the communication that two apps can have, where Windows forms this communication channel that allows apps to just work better together. So as you implement more contracts, um, what happens is like the users install more apps on their system, and they just get a better experience because now I, I can have more than one app from where I can go uh, pick data. And so examples of such contracts are also the share contract, uh, the search contract, the file picker contract. So um, 
if uh, some of you were here earlier this afternoon, um, there was a talk by my colleague, uh, Jake Stabulski, uh, who talked about all the improvements that we've made um, to existing Windows 8 contracts in 8.1, uh, which is, uh, I'd encourage you to check it out online once, it's get, once it gets posted, if you weren't able to catch it in person. So the reason I uh, wanted to refresh that is uh, when we talk about uh, integration with people and events, we are continuing to build upon this concept of app contracts that we introduced in Windows 8 uh, so that apps still continue to work better together, even after you have access to um, the user's data stores, such as their contacts and calendar. And we'll see how that works. So with that, we'll talk about the first thing which we have on the agenda for today, which is um, how do I connect with people from my apps? So we use a lot of devices today, which devices um, you guys got yesterday. And with all of these devices, it's important that um, there's an address book or a contact list because the people that we communicate with and share with are important to our experiences of how we use those devices. Uh, there is several ways today, I was just chatting with somebody earlier today, is, is how we communicate with contacts, right? There is uh, people whom you uh, contact via email, there's people whom you call, there's people whom you text message. There's like different ways and levels in, in, in how we communicate with people, and it's different for different people. And these communication experiences are important to the way we use these uh, uh, devices, whether it's our phones or tablets or our PCs. So in Windows 8, what we did is, how we met this need is with the People app. Uh, if you use the People app, you'll see that you get this beautifully tailored experience with uh, all your personal and work contacts alive with their social activities, photos, just instantly ready and, in and ready for you to engage with them. It's more than your address book because it's built for the way uh, how we communicate today. So, it connects to a variety of uh, social accounts, which we all have. And these are um, uh, accounts which we use to connect to different people today. And so what we do is, um, once you connect to these social accounts um, that are tied to your uh, Microsoft account, we uh, get a copy of your contact list uh, from the cloud. And now uh, this helps you bring together all of your contacts in this one easy to use and access place. And this also roams across all your other Windows 8 PCs uh, and even your phones. So the People app essentially becomes this hub uh, where you go to do things that are all things people in some way. So you can also select a particular person. And then you know, if it's Ben, then there is multiple ways available for me to reach Ben. In the case of Ben, he's somebody whom I can always reach on Skype. And so that's the way I would choose to interact uh, with with some or all of my contacts. So this is all great. And why am I telling you all this, if it's all so great, is that the experience I have uh, with people kind of stops here. There is no easy way for me to now step out of this app and bring these people into the other hundreds of Windows Store apps that I also use on my device. And that kind of makes it hard because now if I need to do some communication action with a person, I have to separately go navigate to another app, um, start that action, and then come back to the app that I was originally using. So this is disruptive, right? I already lost focus in what I was doing. I already lost focus um, in your app, and I may or may not come back to that app. So we've, when we thought about this, we thought, wouldn't it be nice if there was just an easy way for you to just connect with people right from your apps. And so it turns out that in Windows 8.1, the investment that we've made um, in the area of people allows you to do just that. So we've made it easy with a Windows-drawn contact card that is launched right in your app, where you can not only look up information about someone you know, but you can also start uh, communication actions with them from, right from the contact card. I will quickly see how this is done. So I'm going to launch the um, mail app. Uh, you guys probably saw this at the keynote yesterday. Um, the mail app, we've made some improvements to that for 
Windows um, 8.1 uh, that will be available to you when Windows 8.1 ships. So one of the things um, in the mail app, I'm going to look at this email where we see there's a surprise birthday party coming up for Frank, which Ben is trying to organize. Uh, great, and so generally you glance over who are the people that are going to come to the party. And in addition to just like looking at, looking at them, when I tap at a particular contact, I get their contact card. Now this is the same information about Ben that I can see in the People app, but now I can also see that same information in, in my Mail app. And after seeing this information, there's ways in which I can reach Ben, right? So Ben sent out this email about the surprise party, but he doesn't put in a date. Um, you know, it's a surprise party, so we need to make sure like Frank can be there on time or whatever. And so from here, I can quickly decide to call him, which will um, launch the Skype app, and I could initiate that call, um, which isn't going to go through like this. Ben's not going to answer. But you get the idea, right? Um, so similarly, uh, there's other people on there too, like, for example, Jenny, right? When I bring up her contact card, um, maybe I want to send her an email on a different email address, which is here, because that's a better email address to reach her. And I can do that right from her contact card to maybe tell her to bring cake from the bakery that is next to her home, right? Um, Similarly, uh, you know, Frank needs to come to his own surprise party, so we've made plans to make sure that we can um, bring him to his party by telling him, like, hey, let's meet up for lunch. And so when Frank replies, uh, yeah, of course, um, I can come to lunch, I want to bring up Frank's contact card and see where Frank lives so I can uh, find out how much time I need to allow for commute um, to go pick up Frank. Right, and he lives in New York, and the party's in New York, so uh, this is the this is this is an experience where I can I can quickly complete those actions while still doing uh, or being in the mail app. Uh, now, one of the things, in addition to just launching apps, uh, what you're seeing here is the experience is not only seamless but also personalized, because I know I'm looking at maps, uh, I'm looking at Frank's address. And so Maps is able to tell me that by showing me Frank's name and Frank's thumbnail. And this is the information that I was able to pass to the Maps app from the Mail app uh, to allow the Maps app to present information to me in this way. So even if I look away and come back, I, I know what I was doing is I was looking at Frank's address. And so this uh, interaction between two apps can only get richer from here. This is just a sneak peek into what's possible. And so when I've done with the Maps app, I can quickly go swipe it away. Um, there's just one more thing uh, which I wanted to show here is uh, this email which I got from Wendy about uh, having dinner tonight. And you know, uh, with the Bill Conference, we've been always uh, looking for places where to eat dinner. Uh, and yesterday we were wondering, like, hey, are there good any seafood places here? And uh, so Wendy sent me this link saying, like, um, hey, there is this uh, uh, place that I found, and she it's a link to. Um, Yelp, so that brings up uh, the browser with the Yelp links, and she asked me to make a reservation uh, if I like the place. So I think we were talking about this uh, uh, Tadik Grill, maybe it was. And so now with IE 11, you see that uh, there's this new feature where the phone number links light up, and I can just click on that phone number link, and right from there, I get the contact card, this time only with the phone number, and I can initiate the call from there. And I can go back to doing mail. Pretty cool, right? So let's go take a look at how all this works. So the workflow for initiating the contact card starts in your app, right? It can be the Mail app, it can be IE, it can be any of the um, hundreds of thousands of Windows Store apps um, that are out there. The only thing that the app has about a person is some hint, like their email address or their phone number. And generally today we see that apps that deal with people have this kind of information because um, you either ask them to um, sign in to your app with an, uh, or create an account, so you have their email address. Uh, in the case of uh, IE, they have a phone number. So there is some hint that tells us um, who that contact is to be able to uh, find their match. 
And once you, um, once, once you are an app that has this information, um, and all I'm trying to tell you is like, you don't have to be an app that has a contacts database, right? You can be an app that has little bit information about a person. You can also be an app that has a lot more information about contacts. Uh, we'll see that in a bit. Um, from here, you call into the new Windows Runtime APIs uh, for initiating the contact card. And this API essentially um, goes and queries into the Windows Contact Store. The Windows Contact Store is um, populated by the uh, services that you're connected to in the People app. The People app still continues to be, uh, to be your um, address book, to be the app that helps you manage and aggregate all your contacts information. Uh, but now that information is available to Windows as well. And so once I query the Windows Contact Store, um, I get the information back if I find a match. And so there's a query layer that sits on top of this contacts database that helps retrieve the contact information um, that matched my query results, and it helps populate this contact card. There's also a case where I did not find a match in the Windows contact store, which is also fine, because in that case, we just show the contact card with the data that comes from your app. So in this case, uh, your app provided me the data for uh, Ben. That's maybe his name and his uh, thumbnail and an email address or a phone number. I will just show you that uh, data. And then the user has the option to go add that or save that information um, to their people app. So once I get the uh, contact card, now um, the apps portion is done, right? As, as, as the app developer, you don't have to worry about what the user does next from the contact card. but the user can go initiate other actions uh, from here. And with the new uh, preference, windowing preference model that we have and the multiple view sizes that we support, uh, you get an experience where the app that's launched from the contact card remains alongside your app. So most of the times, you end up in these side-by-side -side experiences. So in this case, uh, what was launched is uh, the Skype app. And so in addition to the uh, action type, which tells it like, hey, what's the activation contract in which I should launch the target app? We also pass this uh, uh, rich contact object to the target app that allows this target app to provide uh, that experience that Bing Maps was able to provide by personalizing it with the name and the thumbnail and, and such. So um, with the Windows uh, 8.1 release preview, uh, which you guys have yesterday. The built-in apps, the updates to the built-in apps are coming. They're, they aren't in the Windows 8.1 release preview, but they will be available when we ship Windows 8.1. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out is the experience that you get now when you use these APIs will be where uh, when you try to invoke the contact card, um, because the people app and the mail apps aren't available, uh, the updates aren't available, the data that will be shown on the contact card will be the data that comes from your app. So in the next couple slides, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about what the contact card is uh, and the user experience and just the point of view around choosing this model versus um, um, other different options that are available. So the, the contact card displays information about your contact, but it does so, as you can see, in a non-intrusive uh, manner, right? It does, it does so right in your app, so the experience is uh, in line to your app, it, even though it's drawn by the system, even though the data is owned by the system, by Windows, uh, and the UI is owned by Windows. Uh, and we personalize it to the extent where um, the color that you see on the banner of the contact card is actually the color from your app, your app style. Um, so if there was you know, a different app, other than the mail app, you would see a different tile color. And so to the user, it feels like it's just right in the app. Now, even if you had multiple apps um, open um, on a user's machine, which is now possible with the updates in 8.1 uh, with the multitasking, the contact card will always appear overlaid on top in your app. So you don't have to worry about your app ever getting replaced when you bring up the contact card. It will get overlaid on top of your app. And it's lightweight because um, it's just it's a light dismiss style flyout. So you tap anywhere outside of the contact card, it's dismissed. The uh, user doesn't have to manually uh, manage the app. It just runs like it's running in your app. 
And lastly, it's um, consistent because as I was mentioning, the user gets used to seeing the information about their contact the same way, no matter which app they're using, whether it's the mail app or whether it's any other third party app, it, the, the information that I see about Ben is coming from my Windows uh, database, and so I always see it in the same way, irrespective of how much information the app has about that contact or not, uh, which is really powerful for the user because uh, now I can you know, just use any app that I want, and I see the person uh, represented in the same way. And from there, I can take uh, actions on them in the same way. This is an important thing um, which we were discussing earlier today as well, is we know that there is um, uh, apps out there that have uh, been known to upload users' entire address book data uh, without the user having a clear indication uh, of what just happened. Uh, what this has done is that it has created a lot of buzz um, and in, in the media and also news, which has made users just more aware and also skeptical about apps that request data to their contacts or personal data like that. Uh, so users are, are wary about installing apps um, that, that ask for these kind of permissions uh, to the extent that um, there was a study that was done by the, um, uh, by the Pewter Research Center the, uh, on Internet and American Life Project uh, that found that 57% of all app users, that's like more than half, more than half of all app users are not even installing apps that request access to personal data, such as the user's contacts or their calendar and so on. And what this means is that now your app's reputation is at stake, right? The integrity of your app is being challenged because you don't want to be one of those apps um, that, uh, is, is, uh, that the user is afraid to install. And so with the Windows model, you don't have to worry about, about all of that. The user's data remains private and secure. You're letting Windows manage that. You don't have to be in the business of managing uh, or protecting users' data. You don't have to worry about asking for permissions to access their data. And you're still able to provide that experience in your app so the user doesn't have to go elsewhere or go to another app to complete that action. So they stay focused, they stay engaged in your app. Um, it's a win-win situation both for developers and for your users uh, to choose a model like that. Next, we'll talk about the actions which we keep seeing on the contact card. Um, so the full list of actions that are supported on the contact card for Windows 8.1 uh, are the following, right? So you can email, you can call. Calling can be over a phone number, or it can be over a connected service like Skype or mess Messenger or other services like that. Similarly, messaging and video calling uh, are over connected services. Uh, you can map an address like we saw uh, with the Bing Maps app. Uh, if you have an address, and you can also post to walls like Facebook, Twitter, etc. So these are all the actions that, that are supported. However, the set of actions that are surfaced on the contact card will always be limited to the top three actions that we have available. So if you have more than three actions uh, available for a contact, then um, those won't, then those will be prioritized in a way that we show email, call, and message. Uh, over the other actions. And this is just to make sure that the experience continues to feel lightweight. We don't want to overwhelm the user with all the ways you can communicate with a contact. There is an easy way for them to do that. If, uh, in this case, for Ben, if I want to go look up his address, but I don't find it on his contact card, I can quickly open up um, his profile, which launches the People app. And from there, I can contact Ben in all the other ways that were not available to me on the contact card. And again, this example is from the mail app, so your app remains alongside. And then I can dismiss the, uh, the people app and then go back to my app that I was doing. Additionally, we've also seen that um, users have multiple phone numbers and multiple emails. So the contact card supports that with the drop down that you see over there. And it also remembers the uh, default option for that user. So in the case of Ben, as I was mentioning, um, is always available on Skype. I don't have to remember that. That's just the default option once I've gone and communicated with him via Skype. Next time, if I don't find him over Skype and I choose a different dropdown, then that gets set as the default. So the system remembers that 
um, throughout. Um, the logic that's built into the contact card is also aware of uh, what actions to expose, right? So for a person, um, if you don't have a phone number, then we won't show the call action, or we limit it to email. Um, so for a contact that's like a dentist, um, if you don't have the email address, you have their phone number, so you see their contact card um, differently, like that. And then for contacts that are like your Twitter contacts, you can only post to their wall. Uh, you'll see their contacts without an email or a call action. So it's, it's based on what data is available for a contact, and it's contextual to that. So for contacts which come from the app that are not already in the user's contacts data store, uh, there's a way to quickly add that information um, to their contacts database via this add contact action. So whatever information the app provided will get saved automatically just with that one tap uh, into the people app. So with that, I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, talk about a little bit about, as you're thinking, like, OK, so this is all good, but like, does this fit with the kind of apps I have? So I wanted to provide an example and see, um, uh, help you think about whether this fits with the kind of apps you're thinking about uh, writing or already have. So uh, as I mentioned, right, the contact card can be shown with apps that just have um, some information that we use to query the contacts data store. And that information today is their email address or their phone number. And you can give us multiple emails and multiple phone numbers. There are apps that have um, richer information about contacts. So maybe you're writing a student's database app or your own customer's app, and you want to bring up the contact card just for the communication actions. Uh, then we'll use the data that you give us and show it on the contact card. Uh, obviously, optionally, the user has the option to go save it if they, if they choose to. And then. Uh, the third experience is around uh, apps that uh, support importing data from other apps. So the example I showed uh, in the beginning where I go and get the address in the Maps app. So that's using the contact picker contract. And so using that, the app can get information. And then just on the imported contact, I can show the contact card. So these are the categories of apps that um, today exist in the Windows Store that are about that are about connecting people, right? Like people are social groups and you know each other. And we think provide a way where it would be useful um, to have something like a contact card so I can quickly not only look up people, but I can start interacting with them as well. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. This is just to uh, kind of illustrate to you the, the, the apps that are out there and see if your app kind of fits into one of these categories or, or not. Like one of the examples that um, uh, I was thinking about is um, I use the Connect Health app. And the Connect Health app actually um, has this cool feature where they actually um, take a video uh, while you're working out. And uh, they post the video uh, onto the app um, to share with your friends. And so other friends who are also using the Connect Health app can see how well or poorly you did on your workout, uh, which is always fun because after a workout, when I look at other people who did the same workout and see them getting a higher score, I want to send them a message or I want to tell them, like, whoa, like, how, how are you able to do this, right? Like, you want to send them some kudos or something like that. And so for this kind of an app, it's great if I can just, like, pop up their contact card right there and send them a message. And so now the Connect Health app doesn't have to be in the business of implementing, replicating functionality such as messaging right into their app. They can keep focusing on the value add of their app, which is about you know, creating these virtual workout videos and uh, uh, interacting with contacts, just you get them for free by using other apps that the users already have on their system. So we've talked about this contact card, but you're curious about how much code you have to write to uh, enable this scenario. So I wanted to show you the uh, the demo app for which I'll be showing you code. And so this is just a events app where I have some uh, conferences that I'm going to be attending, and then also some personal events. So in this case, earlier we were talking about Frank's surprise party, and I have that event um, in my events app now, so I know when it's happening. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So this was the app uh, that I was showing earlier. And so I have this event coming up, which is... Um, Frank's uh, birthday party. And one thing when you have an event is you want to always look up who are the other people that are coming. 
And so in this case, the app has information about uh, the name of the person who's coming and maybe even their picture because uh, they were able to set that within the app. Or they could choose not to show the picture. It's up to the app. And so from here, when I click on it, OK, you're supposed to see the contact card. We'll try that again. So you get the idea. I wanted to show you the code for that. Um, so in this case, the part where you create your contacts database is all relevant to your app. We're going to talk about the details about that. Um, in my demo app, I just have a simple list view uh, for all the contacts and, and a little bit information about them. And what happens is when I, when I click on the person um, to bring up their contact card, I am essentially creating the contact object, which is under um, windows.applicationmodelcontacts.contact. So this is a new uh, contact object that we've defined in Windows 8.1 that uh, allows you to populate the contact object with, uh, uh, with multiple fields. And some of them are like their phone number, their email address. And all I'm doing, that, all I'm doing here is uh, I'm creating the, the data, and I'm appending it um, to the contact object. So I can just populate the contact object with as little as one email or one phone, phone number. And then the last thing before I call the API is um, we're seeing that the contact card appears as a flyout in your app. And you actually control the position of this flyout. So in order to do that, the API takes in a rect, which is essentially the, um, the area of user selection that you don't want covered. So whether that is tapping on the user tile, whether that's a button, whatever the source experience is in your app, you don't want that covered. And so you get the coordinates uh, for that, the x and y coordinates, uh, and the, uh, the width. Actually. And, and you specify the selection rect for that. Once you have that, this is the API we call, which is under Contacts Manager, Show Contact Card, which takes in the contact object, takes in the selection rect, which we just talked about. And lastly, it takes this placement, which is uh, an optional parameter to specify whether you want the contact card to come above, below, uh, left or right of the uh, UI that you don't want covered. So if you don't specify that, then Windows will pick the, uh, the preferred option for you. But you know, you know your app best. And so if there is a certain area that you don't want to hide, maybe it's on the left side of your app, then you can specify the placement as right or below um, or top. And, and so that's it, right? Uh, additionally, uh, if you were an app that had more information about a contact, then the contact object is, um, is, is pretty rich. And so in addition to providing the names, uh, it takes in all these other fields. So you can provide their addresses, um, their connected service accounts, their emails. So you can provide a pretty rich contact object um, to the app to show their contact card, which is what I'm doing in this example here. So here you specify their um, thumbnail, which is uh, done here, actually with uh, it's a random access stream reference. And so I created a file, uh, an image file, and then I specified that as a random access stream and provided that to the thumbnail property on the contact object. This is how I provide an address and then phone numbers and emails. And then lastly, I'm doing the same thing, which is uh, once I get the bounding rect, uh, I can provide uh, the selection area and I can um, call the contact card API to show their contact card. So even though uh, the demo code I'm showing you is in uh, JavaScript, uh, these APIs are projected in C++, uh, if that's your uh, language of choice, or C Sharp.
So just a quick recap of the APIs we saw, and this is just more, more for reference since these slides will be available to you later. Uh, we looked at the show contact card API. Really simple, you create the contact object, provide the selection rect, and optionally a placement, and that's it. Just three lines of code. Uh, this API is something we didn't talk about. It's more for the advanced case scenarios where you have more data about a contact, but it's not local. Maybe you need to contact another service or a cloud. And the contact card has provision for this uh, by showing the data that you give us initially. And then you can refresh the contact object with more data. And then we'll show the remaining data on the contact card. So for that, you would call the delay loaded contact card API. So, so far we were talking about um, the source apps uh, part of the equation with the contract, right? And so the contact card is something that the source app would bring up. And the contact card essentially becomes this jumping off point for launching other apps, which are your target apps. And it essentially becomes this pluggable model for these kind of apps. Um, so if you have apps that support any of these actions, that are supported on the contact card, then you can uh, become the target app uh, to support that action. So uh, at a high level, what you do is you declare in the manifest uh, that you want to be the target app, uh, and you support that activation contract. And there's more documentation about this on um, MSDN on how it's done. Uh, I'm not covering going into details for how to become a target app, uh, but the idea is that um, you can, if you choose to um, be that app, essentially what that allows is if I prefer using your app in addition to launching your app just from the start screen via the tile, I can continue using your app even from the contact card if you support the activation contract for, for those actions. And the built-in apps that will be available for some of these actions are, for example, for email, uh, email is done simply via the mail to protocol. So any app on the system that supports the mail to protocol, the user will be able to select their preferred app um, that launches from the contact card. And the model for that is similar to how uh, you pick defaults for uh, files and protocols today. Um, so you select that uh, the first time uh, and set a default. And then for subsequent times or when you have new apps, you can go and change that default uh, either in PC settings or when you're invoking that experience. Uh, for call, the existing Windows 8 Skype app that we saw in the demo uh, supports calling phone numbers, and the updated Skype app, which will be available with Windows 8.1, will also support uh, connected services. So you can call uh, someone using their Skype uh, connected service or Messenger or whatever network Skype supports. And similarly, you can video call them or message them using Skype. And then for address, the Bing Maps app supports that contract today. Um, the Bing Maps app is available in the store, and that's what we've been seeing in the demos today. It actually comes pre-installed also. So the contact card really does help you um, leverage a lot of things that Windows provides, a lot of things that the other target apps on the user system provides to provide a richer experience, right? So you can stay focused on the value add of your app and let Windows and all these other target apps do the hard work to uh, enable some really rich and powerful experiences. And I also want to emphasize the, the, the security model about keeping the user in control, uh, where you don't have to worry about requesting access or keeping the user's data private or secure with this model. Um, the data remains um, uh, in the system. It's uh, only shown to the user. Uh, your app doesn't get that data. Um, the data that apps do get is only when I invoke an action from the contact card and the target app will get that limited data only for that contact. So it's not a programmatic access where you can get the user's entire address book into your app. And you get all of this while keeping the user engaged in your app, which is, I think, really important uh, for us when we think about writing our apps. It's like, how can I keep users just staying in my apps? And that's why we try to replicate as much functionality as we can in our app. And so this kind of takes a little bit away uh, from, from doing that. So shifting gears, um, not completely, but when there's people, there's also events. And uh, that's another data store where integration with uh, your apps is really important.
So one of the things we do today is um, when you want to make a plan or you have like what's going on in the day is you go to your calendar to take a look about what events you have, um, whether you can make those plans to go to the movies or the party or whatever it is, um, which is fine. However, like some of the apps that you see um, on, on the left-hand side there is are apps which are in the Windows Store today, right, that I use. Uh, some of these could be your apps. But they also have events and appointments in them, right? There's Facebook events, there's Evite invitations, there's meetup groups, there's hotel restaurant reservations, travel booking events, uh, all kinds of information. And today, because there's no easy way for me to get the information that I have in those apps into my calendar, my apps are essentially siloed, right? They each have their own calendaring solution, but there is no one place for me to see aggregated information about all the things I have going on in the day. And what we want is really take out that barrier between the apps and the calendar and provide an easy way for me to get the events and information that I have into, in, in my apps into the user's calendar. So what we've done in Windows 8.1 is provided you just that, right? An easy way for you to get your events into the user's calendar. And we'll see how that's done. So same example, I have my events app here. But in this case, notice I have, I can see it. <laughs> So I have my events app here uh, um, that I was showing you earlier, and it's Frank's surprise party. Now, in addition to seeing my people, uh, one of the things that was missing in my app earlier was the ability to uh, add that information to my calendar. And before I add an inf inf uh, some information to my calendar, generally what you want to do is, uh, oh boy. Okay, move to Okay, let's come to that in a bit. See if I can get that working. Okay, I promise to come to that demo later. later. We'll keep going ahead here. So what you would have seen is um, a workflow which starts again in your source app where you're trying to add information to the user's calendar. And um, from there, you call this API, the, which is a Windows Runtime API, that essentially uh, takes in a date, the time frame in which you want to see uh, the user's calendar. And it takes in a duration, which is essentially a hint for the calendar app to decide what's the best uh, view to give you when I launch, right? Should it be the day? Should it be the hour? Should it be the week? Is it, the, is it, is it um, three months from now? Uh, and then based on that, you get side-by-side um, -side, uh, view of the calendar app alongside your app. And from there, the user can uh, completely browse the calendar app like it was launched um, in, in a main, main view activation, like how you would launch the app from the tile. Uh, and then they can choose to dismiss it after they've quickly seen um, their availability. And the next first workflow after you've looked at your availability is you want to get those events into the user's calendar. And so that workflow again starts from your app and you call into the uh, Windows Runtime APIs for adding an event to the user's calendar. Um, that essentially brings up this UI, which is a flyout 
which shows the information um, that you're trying to add to the user's calendar. The UI that you see uh, in the flyout is the UI that is provided by the calendar app. And uh, the flyout has two pieces. It has the header. The header has um, information uh, such as the calendar app, the, the name of the calendar app that you're launching, if you had more than one, and the logo. And that's actually owned by uh, system, by Windows. And additionally, uh, the body of the flyout, the experience um, that's provided in there, uh, is provided by the calendar app itself. And they know what's the activation uh, in which they are being launched. Uh, via the activation uh, verb uh, that is passed to them. So in this case, they know it's adding an appointment, so they can show the UI which is relevant for adding an appointment. And uh, it's up to the calendar app about uh, uh, what, uh, if you have multiple calendars, then they can provide an experience for you to pick a calendar from the dropdown there. Uh, or uh, if there's some additional editing experience um, that you want before you can quickly verify uh, what's the information that you're being what, that you're about to add, and then lastly, you choose to uh, add that data, and it goes um, it goes into your calendar. So again, the model here is such that um, the user is really in control. Um, their apps aren't just able to add information to my calendar without my knowledge. Uh, it always goes through this experience, uh, which is in my app. So uh, just like the contact card. The calendar flyout is also always drawn in your app. So it's overlaid on top. It is lightweight, uh, as in also light dismiss. So if I tap anywhere outside of this flyout, it's going to go away. So unless the user clicks on add explicitly, no information is added or saved to their calendar. And then lastly, um, after adding add, I get that information saved into my calendar. And the calendar app will uh, notify um, the uh, app that invoked the experience to add the calendar uh, that the event was added. And additionally, also provide an event identifier, which is associated with the event that you just added. And this identifier can later be used uh, if you choose to save it and then also roam it uh, if you want to provide the experience for updating the events. So if plans change and you want to replace the event or you want to remove the event, then you can use this event identifier to uh, ask for um, modifying that particular event or replacing that event in the user's calendar. It is a globally unique ID. The question was if the ID is unique across all devices. So for view calendar, um, you'll see that the, the code that I have to write for this is I just create the, the date time object, which is essentially the date to which I want to launch the calendar app. So in this case, it's um, launching it to the current date. Um, this is the year, and uh, this is the month. It starts from zero, so it has that one subtracted. And then the, uh, the time. And then after that, I call uh, the Appointment Manager API. Uh, this API is called Show Time Frame Async. And that takes in the date, the time frame. And additionally, it takes in this parameter, which is uh, the duration. Right? So in this case, uh, if you do the math here, it's one hour. Right? So I want to show the calendar in this date uh, for an hour. So now the calendar app can provide me an experience where it just shows me a day view or a week view. Uh, it's up to the calendar uh, how this is done. So it's really simple. Uh, the next workflow we looked at is about adding an event to the user's calendar. Um, so here, the way the uh, source app, which is your app, and the calendar app talk to each other is via the strongly typed appointment object. So I create this appointment object, which takes in all the information about the event. So there is the the time, the duration, the location, uh, et cetera. And this is a fairly rich object, which has um, other things, such as uh, uh, other properties, uh, which are used generally with appointments, in addition to the ones which are here. Um, there is also recurrence, 
So we support like full EAS recurrence. If you wanted to create events that were recurring uh, multiple times, uh, then you can create that information in your app and provide that to the calendar using this API and by setting recurrence. Uh, reminder, sensitivity, et cetera. So once I create my appointment object, similar to the contact card, uh, the calendar flyout is also something which you control where you would like to place that in your app. And so you provide the uh, uh, selection area, the rect, uh, just exactly the same way like you do for the contact card. Um, so I get the, the bounding rect, and uh, after that I call into the appointment manager API um, to actually add the appointment. So it takes in the appointment object, the selection rect, and the optional placement. Uh, and in this case, uh, what I'm doing, uh, if I can show you the demo, is if I get a successful appointment ID back, then I know that the appointment was added in my source app, and I can choose to um, change the text that I show on the button from add calendar to remove appointment, or appointment was added, or whatever um, the scenario is in your app. So that's it. That's the, um, the appointment APIs. Uh, additionally, as I was talking about, that there is uh, also APIs uh, for the show. And all these APIs are preceded with um, show to indicate that uh, they will show UI uh, in your app. So both for the contact card as well as the appointment, uh, if you're wondering why they all start with show, it's to indicate that these uh, APIs provide UI. Uh, the add appointment async, which we just looked at in code, uh, where you create the appointment object, provide the selection rect and the uh, optional placement, and then get back a unique ID that is associated with your event. Um, additionally, uh, if you want to provide the experience for later updating that event, replacing that event, then you can use the, use the show replace appointment async API. It's exactly similar to add in that you provide the full event information to this API in addition to the appointment ID. So if the event was not found, then we just go ahead and add that as a new event and give you back a new uh, event ID. And then um, remove is slightly different as in it doesn't take an appointment object, but it just takes an uh, event ID. And if the event is found, then we go ahead and remove it. Um, if it's not found, then it'll just return. So you can see that how um, these APIs just let you quickly integrate um, events which you have in your app to the user's calendar. And it's um, done in a way where users continue to stay in their apps. They don't have to manually copy this information out from your apps and add it to their calendar or navigate away from your app. So it's really quick and easy for them. And it's also done in a way where um, users' preferences are maintained. So uh, the calendar app um, that comes up in the flyout is the user's preferred calendar app that supports this action contract. So when we ship Windows 8.1, the built-in calendar app will support this contract. Uh, it's not available for the release preview, but when we do ship 8.1, uh, the calendar app. Now, additionally, other calendar apps can also support this contract, and if that's the user's preference, then they can set that. Uh, and so when they try to add events, um, they will see the UI that that calendar app provides, which is essentially what my demo calendar was doing, um, if I can get to it at the end of the talk. Uh, and again, um, to emphasize on the confidence model here, which is um, you aren't uh, writing data into the user's calendar without their consent. Uh, the UI is a nice way for me to go quickly verify that information that is getting added to my calendar, even maybe select the calendar I want the information to be added to. And uh, from there, um, the information is in there. So all the hard work really is essentially being done by uh, Windows in providing this uh, UI and this experience and by the calendar app. And all your app is doing is calling these APIs to just integrate with those experiences. So after all this, the um, call to action really is just think about um, what your apps are and if these experiences, these contracts that we talked about today, especially the contact card, is something that makes sense for you to leverage. 
um, because it's really an easy way for you to provide the experiences that you would otherwise provide in your app uh, in a much simpler way and in a way that keeps the experience also consistent for the user because they can keep using the apps that they like uh, for these kind of actions. And then similarly for calendar, if you have apps that deal with events and appointments information, there's no reason why you wouldn't use the appointment APIs to quickly get that information added into the calendar um, for the user to have a much better experience. So I'm really looking forward to um, seeing your apps uh, in, the, in the store that use these contracts and some interesting things that you do with those apps. Um, so some of the things that I browsed over, uh, especially related to the activation contracts for the target apps, I've included links to the documentation that we have for that, um, both for the calendar app as well as if you're interested in activation contracts for the target apps for communication actions. And additionally, we have SDK samples for uh, the APIs that I showed you today, uh, which are all available uh, with the release preview. And lastly, I'd like to call your attention out to um, take the uh, evaluation, um, spend a few minutes doing that. And uh, uh, thank you all. I'll, I'll keep working and see if I can get the demo to work, so if you want to hang out uh, for that. But otherwise, um, thanks all uh, for coming.